How's everybody doing? It's Big Mike, and today is Monday, March 13th, 2023. It is the day after the 95th Oscars. And go ahead and settle yourself in, get yourself a snack, get yourself a little drink. This is going to be a little lengthy. It is now time for my annual Oscars recap. So let's see where we can get started. First and foremost, I... I liked a lot of the people that won. I thought some of the awards were very well deserved, others not so much. The whole thing overall, it was very standard. You know, there really were no big, big surprises. Um, you know, a certain movie took home most everything while so many others got left in the dust, which I found a little odd. but. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Let's talk about some key points here. And I want to start off with the one that hurts me the most is Jamie Lee Curtis winning the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress over Angela Bassett. Let it be clear, I did enjoy Jamie Lee Curtis's performance in Everything Everywhere All at Once. You guys can check out my review for that from nearly a year ago. Go down here, it's in the description. I recorded that review almost exactly a year ago on March 30th, 2022. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, she was fine in that film. But the thing is, Jamie Lee Curtis has always kind of been like a genre performer. I mean, she got her big break in 1978 when she was in the original John Carpenter classic Halloween. She's been in several other horror films since then with things like The Fog, as well as Prom Night. She's been in action films like True Lies. She's, she's done a lot. You know, she's often compared to Sigourney Weaver. Very similar, you know. And uh, the thing is, I don't necessarily have a problem with Jamie Lee Curtis winning the Academy Award. I mostly just have an issue for what she won it for. You know, a lot of people are calling her a Nepo baby because of her family who was also in the industry. You know, Janet Leigh was her mom. Tony Curtis was her dad. They've also got Oscars. So it felt like it was a complete journey for her. And her speech was very moving. It was good. I was, you know, understandably happy for her. But yet, still kind of sad because Angela Bassett lost out again. You know, Angela Bassett famously lost out 30 years ago to Holly Hunter for her performance in The Piano over Angela Bassett's grandiose performance as Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It. And you could clearly see the look of sadness on Angela Bassett's face when she lost. I can understand and sympathize with that. I would be upset too because I really thought she was going to win. But... No matter, it is what it is, and to be honest, you don't need to necessarily have an Oscar to validate your talent or who you are as a person or an entertainer or whatever. It really is just awards at the end of the day, but it still would have been nice. And now moving on, we have Ruth E. Carter winning her second Oscar for the costume design in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. She won the Oscar a couple years back for the first Black Panther for the same exact award. It's nice to see her do a repeat of that, and it really is cool to see that both films have Oscar-winning costumes, and why not? They do look incredible, especially on the big screen. I very much enjoyed her speech, and I thought she was very entertaining, and you could tell that Ruth really spoke from the heart. The next award that I want to talk about is a little twofer here. The Whale naturally, won the Academy Award for Best Makeup. Who didn't see that coming? It made perfect sense because of the way that they transformed Brendan Fraser into Charlie for The Whale. It was very, very well done. It was very deserving of that win. And Brendan Fraser really defied the odds by beating out Austin Butler, who was favored to win for his portrayal of Elvis. And it is a rather interesting comparison to think that you know, Brendan Fraser is winning an award for a fictitious character, whereas Austin Butler is portraying a real-life person. I mean, the Elvis film was a little bit steeped in fantasy, but it was still very entertaining nonetheless. 
but it was kind of crazy to see Elvis racking up all these awards along the way and at the home stretch of awards, he was beaten out by Brendan Fraser. Personally, I felt it was deserved. Austin Butler, you know, he's a young guy. It was his first nomination. He did a great job, great, great job in Elvis. He deserved the nomination. He at least got the Golden Globe. But Brendan Fraser, for him to have a comeback the way that he did, especially after doing films like Journey to the Center of the Earth and Furry Vengeance, this was very well deserved because Brendan Fraser has always had oodles of talent, even when he's been in silly stuff like Encino Man and George of the Jungle. But nonetheless, it was great to see that. And next up, my other kind of big upset, but it was to be expected, was Michelle Yeoh taking home the Oscar for Best Actress in a Leading Role over Kate Blanchett for Tar. Now, while I thought for sure Kate Blanchett and the film Tar itself would have swept the Oscars, I guess times and tastes understandably have changed. And I can respect that. I mean, Michelle Yeoh, she really did give a great performance in Everything Everywhere All at Once. You can tell that she didn't flounder. She really had to work hard portraying so many characters and so many multiverses. Whereas Kate Blanchett, while I do think about it in hindsight, did give a stirring, realistic performance as Lydia Tarr, so good that you would have thought it was a real person. She does admittedly already have two Oscars under her belt. So there you go. But no matter, it was great to see Michelle Yeoh win, and it was great to see an Asian actress win the Academy Award. That was very, very well deserved. She, she really did pull out all the stops, especially after seeing her recently in the re-release of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This felt like the right time overall. Next up is Natu Natu, rightfully so, winning the Academy Award for Best Original Song from RRR, which stands for Rise, Roar, and Revolt. I will say on a side note, I'm a little surprised that that film did not even get nominated for Best International Feature. Um, I guess if this is the best they're going to do, go for it. But that scene in particular in that film was so stirring that, as some of you may know, it made me want to change my Oscar predictions list and I had to make an updated video on Friday that just passed as well as a couple other alterations but that definitely pushed it over the edge because Natu Natu is a sensational song it is a great scene in the film RRR definitely check this movie out by the way but you got to understand something here if you really think about it now hold on before I continue I will say I guess because the film was an Indian production, they say that this was the first Indian film to be nominated and now win the Academy Award for Best Original Song. I could have swore, though, that the song Jai Ho from A.R. Rockman from 2008's film, Best Picture winning film at least, Slumdog Millionaire, uh, Jai Ho, I could have swore that that was the first Indian song to win. I guess it's different, maybe because it had American producers and it was an American production. I could be wrong, I don't know, but no matter, back to where I was, really think here. Natu Natu, a Indian film through and through, with an Indian song through and through, beating out the likes of recent Oscar winner Lady Gaga from A Star Is Born, beating out Rihanna, who is on top of the world right now, especially after her Super Bowl performance, her public pregnancy, and her Fenty line. And most of all, beating out Diane Warren, who was also given an honorary Oscar that night. If you're beating out Lady Gaga, Rihanna, and Diane Warren, you're doing, you're really doing something right. Like that's, that's quite the bridge to break through. And again, the more that I thought about that song after I'd seen that film and the more that I see it now, it just fit. And the performance on the stage from the performers and the singers, it was absolutely delicious. I actually wish they would have left that as the last performance, but we can't all get what we want. And now let's turn our gaze back to Jimmy Kimmel, who was the host. I did find it somewhat awkward that he was constantly referencing and beating it down to the ground, the whole Will Smith incident from last year. 
I mean, every chance he got, he just went with it. Now, I will say, I think a lot of the material that Jimmy Kimmel had to say wasn't written by him. I think a lot of it was written by Glenn Weiss and the other directors and producers of the show. Because I know that a lot of people are harping on Jimmy Kimmel right now for trying to make a joke about Harry Styles speaking to the Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala, who said right back to him, I only talk about peace, thank you. And even though her response was stern and cold by some perceptions, it is understandable. But we don't know. That could have been worked into the bit. And even Cocaine Bear walked up to her and stuff like that. But, you know, no matter, I do think a lot of that stuff was just, it was probably just staged. And speaking of the Cocaine Bear, it was really funny to see someone, I don't know who they are, inside of a bear costume on stage with Elizabeth Banks, poor thing, lost her voice. And it was really funny to see them just, you know, having a little bit of a hammy time. And it was... It definitely brought some levity to an otherwise pretty standard Oscars affair. And let's talk about some other things that were really, really bizarre. Um, first and foremost, no one's really talking about this one as much, but I found it rather rude that after Sarah Polly won the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay, I was very surprised when she asked all the people and the women in the audience who worked on the film to please stand up. If you look at this shot right here in this clip, Rooney Mara, one of the stars in the film, declines to stand up, even going so far as laughing and shaking her head around. I don't know. I, I found that very weird. I mean, that was one of the stars in the film. She's an Oscar nominee herself. I don't get why she was laughing and saying, nah, I ain't standing for that, basically. That was really weird. But... By far one of the biggest things everybody's talking about was Hugh Grant being a complete prick on the red, well, excuse me, champagne carpet, that ugly carpet, it was terrible. But he was so rude to the person asking him questions about his brief role in Glass Onion. Have a look at this clip right here if you haven't seen it. Um, what are you most excited to see tonight? To see. Yeah, well, I know that you probably watched a few of the movies. Are you excited to see anybody win? Do you have your hopes up for anyone? Um, not, not, no, no one in particular. Okay, well, what are you wearing tonight then? Uh, just my suit. Your suit? Who yeah. made your suit? You didn't make it. Um, I can't remember, my tailor. That's okay. Yeah. Ta shout out to the tailor. Yeah. Um, so tell me, what does it feel like to be in Glass Onion? It was such an amazing film. I really loved it. I love a thriller. How fun is it to shoot something like that? Well, I'm barely in it. I'm in it for about three seconds. Yeah, but yeah. still, you showed up and you had fun, right? Uh, almost. Okay, all yeah. right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. It was nice to talk to you. Yeah. All right, back to you guys. I mean, what was with that? I don't know if he was deliberately trying to be cheeky, but with the way that he just rolls his eyes and shrugs it off i mean that's just rude you know I, I i i don't know anybody who thought for one second that it was being cheeky or funny it just it just seemed really arrogant and i mean if you don't want to be interviewed don't walk up to an interviewer and now moving on to the memoriam segment i did enjoy it it was really you know touching to see john travolta practically break down in tears when he referenced Olivia Newton-John, who we recently lost, unfortunately. And I will say the memoriam segment was fabulous, but there were some omissions that very much hurt. I was very much sad to see Haim Topal not referenced at all. He passed recently. I was surprised to see Oscar winner Paul Sorvino. He also wasn't mentioned. Neither was Anne Hesch, and sadly, neither was Leslie Jordan. I would have liked to have seen them referenced on there. It's, you know, it's just a sad fact. A lot of times, the memoriam segment always seems to leave out so many people. They famously, last year, left out Carol Channing, which I was very sad about. But no matter, Lenny Kravitz did a very good job singing the song that was required, and it was pretty solid. And now let's round this whole recap out with some nominations that 
failed to bait anything. So, it's really interesting. Films like Babylon, The Batman, and The Triangle of Sadness, they all had three nominations apiece and didn't win a single one. That's rather bizarre, but here's what's even more bizarre. I'm actually going to go ahead and give you guys a countdown. So, nine, eight, seven, six. You know what those numbers have in common? I'll tell you what they have in common. The Banshees of Inishirin, nine nominations. Elvis, eight nominations. Uh, Fablemans, seven nominations. Tar, six nominations. You know what those four films have in common? Not a single Oscar. I'm sorry. I'm sure stuff like this happens a lot. I haven't really kept too much track. But that is really bizarre that we have seven films. The Batman, Babylon, Triangle of Sadness, Elvis, Fablemans, Tar, and Banshees of Inishirin. And none of them, none of them won a single damn thing. I get that it's just the awards, and I know I said just, you know, 10 minutes ago that you don't need Oscars to validate your talent, but I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. I mean, come on, nine nominations for Banshees of Inishirin, eight for Elvis, seven for The Fableman, Steven Spielberg, a movie about Steven Spielberg himself, seven nominations, and not a single win. This harkens back to 1986, when the other film he directed in, in 1985, was The Color Purple, that famously had 11 nominations and didn't land a single win. And who knew, 35 years later, it would repeat, but instead of it being 11 noms, it's 7 noms and not a single win. And it's Spielberg, for Christ's sake. But that's just, that's just ridiculous. I mean, everything, everywhere, all at once won seven Oscars, including Best Picture, out of its 11 nominations. Now, like I said, I enjoyed the film. I thought it was just fine. It was good enough for what it was. It was entertaining. It was original. It was different. But Best Picture? If you'd have asked me on March 30th, 2022, almost exactly a year ago to this recording, that did I think that this should be crowned the top movie of 2022 absolutely not this is as if something like the dark knight if that had been nominated and that had won you would not have expected it i didn't anticipate even honestly oscar nominations for everything everywhere all at once i i didn't expect that because most oscar bait films if you will they come out during the fall and the winter leading up to the Oscars. That's usually the common practice. And usually in the summertime or the springtime is when a lot of effects heavy action and sci-fi fantasy films come out. And they may get a few nominations, i.e. the Batman. But regardless, the fact that this original and unique sci-fi drama film, which had three Oscar winners for their primary performance, the editing, which it did deserve, I do think it deserved for editing, directing and picture, that's out of this world. And to think, again, much like how I mentioned Natsu Natsu beating out big heavy contenders like Rihanna, Lady Gaga, and Diane Warren, the fact that this one sci-fi dramedy film snatched all the awards from Banshees of Inishirin, Elvis, Fablements, Tar, Babylon, The Batman, and Triangle of Sadness, and didn't let them have a damn thing. That's quite shocking to me, I'm sorry. I mean, call it sour grapes, call it being a crybaby, call it first world problems, I don't give a damn. I just think that's very weird that you have so many films with such a high number of nominations and not a single win even though they had won on other awards like the Golden Globes and the Spirit Awards and such. This is just weird. But of those films, and I'm going to end it with this officially, this video, perhaps the most moving speech and the most moving win was Kihei Kwong winning for Best Supporting Actor for his performance in Everything Everywhere All at Once. 
I absolutely fought back from crying, but I gave in. I couldn't resist. I had to because I know some people out there say they don't like sentimental stuff, and I can understand that. But to see this person who was a child actor from 80s films that we all know and love, like The Goonies and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, short round, he'll always be short round to me, and I still love him. To think that this child actor would leave acting and do more menial, not menial stuff, I'm so wrong to say that, but kind of behind the scenes in the entertainment industry, so to speak. To do that and then have this comeback film a year ago and then just sit on top of the world, it is very refreshing and it is inspiring. And the speech that he gave, the moment he mentioned how he was a kid in a refugee camp and everything, you could see all the truth. You know, a lot of multiple Oscar winners, a lot of them want to go up there and act all, oh, but both his reaction and Jamie Lee Curtis's, admittedly, you could tell that it came from the heart. His more than anything, because you could just tell that he wanted this. And he honestly, now that I think about it, he really did deserve it. I wanted Brian Tyree Henry, and before that, I wanted Brendan Gleeson, but overall, it is Kihei Kwong's, and I will let the last little bit of his speech play out for you guys if you need any further convincing of how appreciative he is. Have a look right here. I owe everything to the love of my life. My wife, Echo, who... <laughs> who month after month, year after year for 20 years, told me that one day, one day, my time will come. Dreams are something you have to believe in. I almost gave up on mine. To all of you out there, please keep your dreams alive. Thank you, thank you so much for welcoming me back. I love you, thank you, thank you, thank you! Well, that wraps up this video of my 95th Academy Awards Oscars recap. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I hope you guys enjoyed the Oscars. I did overall, despite the fact that everything just swept it and basically left everybody else in the dust. But always remember this really important quote from Billy Crystal from just over a decade ago. And he said, and I quote to you, I hope you enjoy yourselves. Nothing can take the sting off the world's economic problems like watching millionaires present each other with gold statues. So let that sink in. Because at the end of the day, they're just awards and we'll still love these films no matter what. I love you all very much. Take care.